are. Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the confines of the mainstream media. I'm very happy to welcome Rob Dietz to Wider View. Rob is the program director at Post Carbon Institute. And prior to joining Post Carbon Institute, Rob worked as project manager at Farmland LP, helping to transition conventional farmland to organic. And he was also the first executive director of the Center for Advancement of the Steady State Economy, taking it from an unfunded startup organization to an internationally respected leader on new economic thinking. He's also the lead author of Enough is Enough, a popular book on steady state economics. And welcome to Wider View, Rob Dietz. Hey, Charles. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on. Well, good. I wanted to talk to you because really the environmental movement uh, kind of got rocked last month by the release of uh, The Planet of the Humans, a new uh, film from Jeff Gibbs and Michael Moore. And um, the Guardian, I think, in its, its review said that uh, big oil and its corporate and banking representatives have, <clears throat> according to this film, found a way to rebrand themselves as green or greenish and to use the green movement for their own ends and to get their mitts on the huge subsidies that taxpayers around the world are handing over to anyone claiming to be developing renewable energy resources, which turn out to be the same old fossil fuel entities in different packaging, end quote. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, what's your what's your take on the film? Um, you know, in terms of 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 that. Well, I think that Guardian article probably goes a a bit far, but you know that sells more articles or, or more papers <laughs> that way. Um, basically, you know, the film has some really good points to it in that it's questioning how much energy does it take to create the renewable energy that, that we call quote unquote green. Um, and it, it, it has a, an important thing to say that we're not going to get to a sustainable society just by swapping out solar panels and wind turbines for the, you know, the, the fossil fuel based economy that we have now. Mm -hmm. However, I think it, the film shoots itself in the foot in a, in a really bad way in the way that it, it uh, it makes it seem uh, or implies that renewable energy sources have no part to play in this. And I, I don't agree with that. Um, I do agree that we're going to have to take a look at how many people we've got on this planet and how much uh, are we consuming and try to get that in line with, with what the planet can support, especially if we want to bring along the, the biodiversity of the planet and, and somehow start getting ourselves out of this sixth mass extinction event. Yeah, um, I would agree. I mean, I think a lot of people that I have uh, read who have uh, criticized the film uh, indicate that the, um, that the look at renewable technology, particularly solar and wind, uh, is – is about 10 to 15 years old and that the technology has uh, greatly improved since then. But um, it's unclear to me whether the un underlying problems that the film brings out, which things like the intermittent nature of uh, renewable power, the expense and the, um, and the environmental impact of the, uh, producing the uh, solar cells and the batteries for storage and so forth. Um, it's unclear to me how much that has improved since the point of the movie. Was yeah. Made. Yeah. And I, I don't want to pitch myself as an expert in the, in the solar industry or the renewable energy front. Uh, you know, I, I just read up kind of like you do, but, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we did produce a book called our renewable future uh, by Richard Heinberg and David Fridley. Right. And that book takes a, uh, a realistic, um, but much more nuanced view than, than the movie Planet of the Humans. And uh, you bring up important problems with wind and solar, and that's the intermittency and the uh, need for storage. And there are other problems too, right? Like we don't currently have the ability to run a lot of the industrial processes uh, without the 
uh, high embedded energy that you get in coal or oil mm-hmm. or, you know, or, a, or a, a power source like that. So there are issues with trying to, say, run the same old growth based industrial society right. on renewable energy. But, you know, we, we know that the fossil fuels are finite and depleting. And even if that weren't the case, we know that we really can't afford to burn them with what we're doing to the climate. So we're going to have a renewable economy, a renewable energy economy, no matter what. It's just uh, how we get there and and how much do we power down from from the industrialism that we're used to. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I hear two points in there. One, one really being uh, one thing that I very rarely hear brought up in in discussions about uh, environmentalism or in the movie, for that matter, and that is uh, conservation. Um, the idea that that we ought to be using a great deal less uh, energy of all kinds than we are currently using. And I'm wondering if that has, <clears throat> the reason that I haven't heard about that may have some connection to the prevalence of, of corporate money and uh, corporate foundation money in uh, funding the environmental movement, which is what the movie seems to imply. Yeah, I think you're pretty hard pressed to to prove that. Um, you know, like right. I'm not pleased that that the Sierra Club, for instance, is not uh, you know is not bigger in the messaging on hey, we need to get a different kind of economy. Uh, yeah, we still need to be worried about population. And let let me be clear on on the population front because you see a lot of people say mm-hmm. uh, if you talk about population. Uh, you're really talking about trying to lower population in in kind of the other in other parts of the world uh, where birth rates are high. That's not how how I think of it. I think we all have a stake in this, you know, especially in the high consuming countries where your population is running through lots and lots of resources. Um, and, you know, the, anytime you talk about population, it can be a uh, a bit of a political third rail, you know, mm-hmm. you, usually you don't get a very good response. And um, but the the kinds of policies that uh, that are the best for for working on getting a sustainable population are things like making sure everyone and especially girls have access to uh, to educational opportunities making sure that everybody can get high quality family planning services and contraceptives and having good quality sex education programs for, for kids, you know, age appropriate as, as they grow. Um, so, you know, most of those policies, uh, you could have some fight with them or, you know, maybe there's some controversy, but, by and large, benign policies. You know, we're not mm-hmm. we're not talking anything like uh, like China's one child policy. Right. So, I think when you talk about population, when you talk about reducing consumption, uh, which is sort of hitting at the lifestyle issues that that people in say America or Western Europe are used to, they're hard topics. I mean, a lot of people they don't want to they don't want to think about uh, how do I have to change, and so it's. It was a lot easier, I think, for the big enviro groups to kind of fall in line with this green technology story. You know, it's kind mm-hmm. of like, oh, we'll have a Tesla economy instead of a Ford economy and, <laughs> and we'll just keep doing more of what we're doing. And uh, it really doesn't work if you all you have to do is look at exponential math and you quickly realize that you cannot keep growing the economy, you can't grow energy usage, you can't grow material throughput forever exponentially on a finite planet. It just, the the numbers become absurd really quickly. Right. And I think part of what happens here, of course, is that the developed world, the the powerful nations like the U.S. and, and other Western European powers are really push a kind of development model on the uh, rest of the world that 
that really exacerbates the problem in that we've turned, um, you know, we, we, we try to turn all of these nations into resource producers for us, um, plant, you know, whether it's palm oil plantations all over the place in Costa Rica or huge mines everywhere, uh, you know, to get all of our, our mineral resources. And, and we've, we've taken away <clears throat> as a result of that, it seems to me a lot of the, um, a lot of the subsistence agriculture that was, um, that was present in these countries and that allowed them at some point to feed their own populations um, where now they've become dependent, moved into cities. And, you know, it, it, it's a model, it, it seems to me, that that is making uh, things worse rather than yeah. better. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to pitch us uh, here in America as, as the bad guys in that I, I don't think there was any bad intentions uh, for the most part. I mean, yes, some, mm-hmm. I, I know you do have some characters out there who will, you know, uh, make a buck at, at any, any cost, you know, and, and that's, you know, you can have a lot of exploitation going on, whether it's of people or places. And, and that's why we find ourselves in this position where we're you know, facing existential threats around climate and around uh, soil loss and, and biodiversity issues and water problems. So uh, I know there are some people out there, but I don't think there was a planned, hey, let's stick it to, uh, to people and make sure they become dependent on us. Um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think that's the usual thinking on it. I think people thought, oh, we'll, we'll get economic growth going everywhere. People rise out of poverty and, and everybody leads the happy consumerist life, right? But, <laughs> uh, but you know, we know from uh, plenty of research that, and I think um, a lot of people know deep down in their hearts that, uh, you know, buying more stuff once you have met your needs is, is not the way to happiness. Um, and it's, I think it is problematic to, to be trying to push the 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 consumerist type growth economy which is what got us into this mess in the first place right. why we're trying to export that and 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 make that uh, dominate how you know the 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 affairs of the globe it doesn't make any sense you know it's it's that old adage of uh, insanity being you know doing something uh, over and over and expecting different results and, mm-hmm. and we're we're seeing the same results and I think that is, you know, back to your original question about Planet of the Humans, I think that was the general point of the movie, that it's really uh, continuous growth of the economy, our consumption that is uh, <laughs> that is the real culprit and something that environmental organizations ought to address. Mm-hmm. And it really should start, uh, and it should go beyond environmental organizations, I think, the the thrust of the American economy ought to be working on changing. It's the economies that have benefited the most from growth that need to take the lead into, you know, stepping back, looking mm-hmm. in the mirror and saying, how can we have an economy that meets our needs without undermining the life support systems of the planet? And let's all right. work together on that. Mm hmm. Well, I think what we end up with is a, a lot of complaints about, well, why should we uh, have to cut back on uh, on our consumption while the people in China and India aren't c- cutting back on theirs? And, well, forgetting that, that they haven't had um, the advantage of several generations of rampant growth yeah it, yeah it's, it's, no, it's 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 a very t- i don't i do not pretend to know politically how to make any of this palatable to uh folks with questions like that i mean yes you can make the logical argument like like you just did but it's it's a we're, we're in a tough spot i mean we got mm-hmm. used to this lifestyle that says uh, make more money, grow more, get bigger, uh, consume more, keep up with the Joneses or surpass the Joneses. So you can, you can be the, the you know, whatever the peacock on your block. And, right. uh, and you know, we're, we're, what 
what I'm saying is if you look at the facts, it's it's a dead end way to go. And Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, convincing people that what they've grown up with, what they know, what they're pitched on a day by day basis. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's a tough one. But um, all we can really do is uh, come forward with the facts, with the stories, with uh, what we know to be true and. Um, that's something I've really appreciated working at Post Carbon Institute. Um, you know, I, I always saw it as a kind of a truth telling organization. It's not always fun to hear, but, um, but I, I think, you know, understanding where we are in society and how we're doing with regard to managing our existence on the only planet we know, uh, can support life. Well, You know, I think people need to uh, understand what's happening and then they can make good decisions from that point. Mm -hmm. Well, we're getting I mean, I think I think the toughest thing, uh, it seems to me, is transitioning from from this, finding a way to transition from this uh, uh, growth forever, uh, you know, totally growth oriented economy. I think uh, it's uh, economist Mark Blythe calls it a uh, as a our economy is like a Mustang with a V8 engine that goes great as long as it's racing down the road, but stop it and it falls apart. Right. But we've we've now had a way to stop it uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, and you know that. That we have considerably slowed the the entire world's economy um, and the use of fossil fuels to the to the point that crude oil is now, you know, they're paying people to take it away. Uh, <laughs> and you know, can we can we learn something from this? Can we, um, you know, can we? We're going to probably have a, a continued economic. Uh, downturn after uh, the virus is is conquered, if assuming it is, um, is this gonna is this gonna give us some idea of how we might get to this steady state economy or or to a a, a much reduced use of uh, fossil fuel? Well, I, I sure hope so, Charles. I mean, you, you can't. Uh... <laughs> ever really predict with certainty what the economy is going to do. I mean, the the case uh, that backs up that point would be go back to 2008, 2009, when we had the, mm-hmm. you know, the Great Recession. There were a lot of people that thought that was maybe a turning point, you know, that we would come out of that with a very different economy. But instead, uh, the United States and governments of the world chose to bail out the the big corporations, the banks and mm-hmm. the and the car companies. And so, you know, I don't know what our economy and our government, what we're going to try to do to sort of maintain the status quo coming out of coronavirus. Now, that said, um, you know, it's a terrible disease and it's wreaking havoc and it's causing pain and and even death, uh, you know, around the globe. And nobody wanted to see an economic slowdown mm-hmm. based on those circumstances. Uh, I mean, this is just this is hor- this horrible. Um, but you know, we, we have what we have, and as you rightly pointed out, we've got a huge economic slowdown, and um, it's amazing how fast that happened. You know, you, yeah, you don't uh, you didn't see any country or or even really uh, much of any locality or community out there saying, "Uh uh-oh, climate change is coming. Let's get a (laughs) sustainable, resilient economy real right quick. Um, But with the coronavirus pandemic, it's, it's not that anybody said, oh, let's let's get a sustainable economy. But the the economic engine, the V8 that you were talking about has, uh, Mm -hmm. has basically stopped or, or at least really slowed down. So yeah, I am I'm hopeful that, you know, there's one thing we've all had, uh, at least those of us who are in, you know, fortunate positions where we're relatively secure, um, 
there's been a lot of time for thinking and a lot of time for introspection. And I'm hoping that we can come through this pandemic with a, a much bigger thought about, hey, what what are my values? What is the economy mm-hmm. for? Uh, why why was I feeling better about not having to do that daily commute to work? <laughs> um, you know, things like that. What what about resilience in our food systems and in our uh, you know, y- you talked a little bit earlier in one of your questions about how the current economic system, uh, a lot of times different places get locked up in this global trade that if there's a hitch, uh, it's not, mm-hmm. you're not able to continue on with it. And so, uh, figuring out how do we have systems, uh, of, you know, to supply chains that aren't necessarily, uh, the most efficient because they've got some resilience built in. Um, and we've seen that in, in our, in our healthcare system as well, you know, with, uh, with protective equipment and, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we felt a little bit more resilient and and even at the cost of efficiency? Uh, mm-hmm. But that's not been how we've been driving. So I'm hoping coming out of the the pandemic, uh, whenever uh, we're fortunate enough for that to happen, that we'll we'll have learned some lessons and we'll be working towards some some better rules for the economy. Speaking of better rules, uh, <laughs> has the Post Carbon Institute done any work along the lines of uh, of figuring out what those better rules might be, or uh, or how we might, you know, accelerate a transition to a, a more resilient economy? Yeah, our our take on it is that well, you know, if if you're having, we talked earlier about how difficult it is to gain traction at a, mm-hmm. at a political level. I mean, can you imagine the, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party coming out and with a platform that says, hey, we recognize the limits to growth. And, <laughs> you know, it's just a, exactly that's kind of the reaction. <laughs> like, this, this isn't going to yeah. happen, not anytime <laughs> soon anyway. So so what we have kind of been, been promoting over uh, the last bunch of years is that It's really at the community scale and working uh, with people, you know, to to build community resilience. And that means uh, bolstering your local economy as much as you can. You know, having the means to produce uh, the goods that you need, especially the necessities like food. Um, Obviously, some places are better suited to do that than others, um, but people are incredibly creative, incredibly entrepreneurial. And I, I think there's all kinds of ways that we can look at how to, how do we get our food? How do we clothe ourselves? What's our transportation system? Mm -hmm. How do we make that available? Even if we're not, uh, somehow connected to a just in time global, uh, (laughs) global economic system that, uh, that as we've seen can be rocked and can uh, can really hurt us where we live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's. I mean, we've we hear a lot about uh, economies of scale, but it sounds like what you're talking about is an economy in which the scale is is a great deal smaller. Where we're we're really saying, you know, let's find a way to uh, to take care of ourselves as a community um, and not not so much uh, depend on the whole rest of the world shipping everything into us. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it's not to say that, uh, that we would eliminate trade or, or not participate at all, but the stronger your, your local economy is, mm-hmm. uh, the better chance you have of dealing with, with global shocks you know, that uh-huh. are are likely to happen. I mean, the the pandemic is one that you know, epidemiologists have been predicting for years. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, guys, I'm fully on the the hopeful front that we will get past this, and really hoping that 
another one does not come along in the near future and that we have some time to to think and to prepare mm-hmm. and to to be readier for something like that but um but yeah i think the 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 more you have strong community ties the more you have um a food network that you understand that uh, maybe you have a role in it um mm-hmm. and the the more your your healthcare system uh is uh has got it what it needs locally uh yeah then you don't you wouldn't have to see some of what we've seen like uh california bidding against illinois uh in order to see <laughs> who gets the ventilators you know right well and, and there's a lot there's an excellent article by the way on kaiser health news this morning about uh you know how our response to this was really um colored by our, our dependence on the uh, the global supply chain and and the uh and the fact that short-term profit is the primary motivation in everything including healthcare, and uh nobody's thinking about the big picture or are planning for uh some eventuality that uh you know that might happen like this that there's just not any money in planning for an epidemic <laughs> yeah yeah, no, I mean, it makes you question uh, how much to trust the profit motive as the underlying principle by which we by which we organize everything that we do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are some parts of of society that are better off uh, without profit being the thing that makes the decision and caring for one another. Uh the healthcare industry is is one of those. You know, do you want a hospital uh, deciding your medical procedures based on what they cost? Uh, <laughs> not necessarily. You you know you you want uh, something in place that allows you to to make decisions that take into account compassion. You know, sort of the the better parts of our human nature rather than right. than the greed or or you know the negative parts of it. Yes, exactly. There's a lot you've given us to think about, Rob. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Uh, and we'll probably need to talk further in the future about uh, about how we uh, how we can make things better on the planet here. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Charles, and thanks for the great work you're doing. All right. Thank you. Thanks again to Rob Dietz of the Post Carbon Institute for joining me this week on Wider View. I'll post links to the Post Carbon Institute and to articles mentioned in the show in the notes at widerviewradio.podbean.com. As always, the views expressed on Wider View are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of this radio station. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening.